Good morning. So I will have the solutions for assignment five posted as a PDF uh, sometime later today. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, mark the assignments and then whatever problems uh, seem to not be too good, I'm gonna make a video for specifically. Um, so, so sort of a, a middle ground between uh, everything the assignments have been so far, just because these assignments are getting quite big, so these solution videos are getting uh, quite long as well, and not too many people are using the videos, so uh, we'll take a look and see what problems people are having and then create the video after that. But the solutions for every single question this week will be available in the assignment solution PDF when it goes up. So. Uh, that will be up by like 5 p.m. tonight. It is made, but I want to make sure that all of the assignment submissions are in before that. And there is like one extension for tonight. So all these assignment submissions will be in by tonight so I can post the solutions by then. Um, anyways, uh, as of, what was it, Tuesday, we finished truth conditional meaning of quantified sentences which is like the end of our compositional semantics. So at this point, uh, what we're doing is uh, sort of taking a look at some things that we could deal with if we had a lot more time in the course or something you might deal with in a grad semantics course, uh, if you did the compositional route. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit more about pragmatics, but instead of just talking about crisis maxims, which is something you might've done in 220 or 282, uh, we're going to mention it, but we're going to talk about it in the context of jokes because, you know, it's, it's the end of the, end of the semester. Let's just have some fun. Uh, talk about puns, talk about uh, irony, sarcasm, and how all that's done in linguistics because we don't have a course for it. And usually uh, the psychology of humor and the psychology of jokes would be done in the psychology department, but also SFU doesn't have a course on that either. So... Uh, it's just one week, it's just a couple hours, but uh, we'll do what we can. Is the stuff for um, jokes and pragmatics, is that going to be on the test? Um, there is going to be like one very simple question about it on the test. And you're basically, uh, we're going to talk about jokes in terms of like, is the joke coming from a phonological uh, incongruity is it coming from like so from like a lexical incongruity or is it coming from like a syntactic congruity so um, we'll talk about what that means but that'll be your question on the test it's like uh, is the joke caused by phonology a word choice or is a syntax so a, a, a nice quick question that is kind of like a not 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 like a free point, but compared to everything else in the course, it's it's a lot more free than than the math stuff. Okay, and also whatever we learn um, next Tuesday is not going to be on the test. Yeah. Um. So like whatever we do today, you'll be able to use for the assignment, and then when you see the test guide, I mean, you'll know exactly what's on the test. So the test guide will be out. Uh, the test is August 6th, which means the test guide will be out a week before that, so July 30th. So next Friday, the test guide will be released. Um, I mean, probably like Wednesday or Thursday, if it's if it's finished before that. So uh, let's talk about tense and time. And if you've taken a course like Link 200, you probably talked about tense and time more than any other course. Um, if you've taken 220 or 322, you probably talked about tense and bit, but maybe not the word time. And the words tense and time are sometimes used interchangeably, which isn't always the best thing because they're not necessarily the same. So uh, languages usually have a tense system that belongs to one of two categories. Um, they have a tense system that like either splits between the past and the non-past. So for instance, English is an example of a past non-past language. So we have uh, 
like a present tense, like jump. This is unmarked. So this means that there's no morpheme at the end of the word or in the word that signals that this is present tense. Um, but we have a marked form of a word that indicates the past tense. So we have this ed morpheme. Now, what we don't have in English is we don't have a morpheme that makes the word future. Uh, so in English, we don't have a future tense. So uh, the ed is a tense marker that attaches to the verb that makes it a past tense form. Now, tense is a grammatical form. So I'll just type this one up. Tense is a grammatical form. So uh, often when you look at, say, uh, ESL textbooks or textbooks about English grammar, they'll say something about English future tense. Um, now, what they mean to say is a word that expresses future time in English. Because English does have this word will, which is a modal. But will does not have future tense associated with it. Instead, this is a word that indicates future time. Uh, it doesn't have a form that is the future. So we don't have verbs that have some future marker on them. Uh, so uh, this is why we say that English is a is a past non-past language, and many languages are past non-past. Uh, we also see a lot of languages that make a future and non-future distinction. So uh, they'll have a, a just sort of like how English has an unmarked version for the non-future, then they'll have a marked version for the future. Um, now, this doesn't mean that there's no languages that do past, present, and future. There are languages that have a past form, a present form, and a future form, but those are much more rare than languages that make these past, non-past, or future and non-future distinctions. So uh, tense and time are correlated with each other. So what this means is that if we use the ED past form, then we can use the past form, and often in sentences, it refers to past time. But this isn't always the case. Uh, so historically, if we think about the words will and would, uh, these are modals, and now these modals don't have tense in English. We, we just say they're modals and they're tenseless. But historically, will and would were present and past tense forms. So would was the past tense form of will. And if we have a sentence like, I would go, I would go to the party. Well, that's not referring to past time. I would go. It's really talking about the future. So that's a case where the past tense is actually used to refer to future time. So that's why we say tense and time are correlated, but they're not interchangeable. You know, sometimes we use um, the present tense as well. So uh, you can say something like, he eats candy. So here's the case of present tense. But in terms of time, uh, this isn't just referring to the present. This is a, but this is a generic statement. Uh, this refers to like, if we have say a timeline, he eats candy, uh, we expect it to occur now, but we expect this to be generic. We expect this to basically be for his, for most of his existence. Um, this is a regular activity that he occurs uh, in partaking in. So uh, again, it's a present tense, but it refers to more than just the present time.
Now, we don't have to just use tense like the ED or the present tense to specify a time in English and in many languages, we have other words. So, for example, with the future uh, time, we can use a modal like will, I will leave, but we don't have to use a modal will. We could just use an adverb of time like tomorrow. Uh, if we want to talk about the past, we could use the word yesterday to be specific, um, but then we would have to also change the tense of the verb in order to make that grammatical. So to have some uh, agreement there. So the main message here is that, you know, tense and time are not the same thing. Tense is a grammatical form and time is talking about when in time the event happened. So in syntax, uh, this tense node and this tense information is represented on T in the syntactic tree. So we haven't seen TPs and Ts yet in this course. And for our composition trees, of course, we can't use them because there's a lot of information that we'd have to uh, work. We need a lot of new rules, essentially. And then we'd have to learn how to deal with tense. Uh, but because we're not doing composition anymore, now we can introduce the TP. So uh, as a reminder, maybe this is new. I think for most of you, you've seen this before. It might have been a while, though. Uh, here is what the TP looks like. So TP stands for tense phrase. So basically the S node is disappearing and we're replacing the S node with the TP node. So we have a couple rules here. Um, first of all, the TP is now going to go to a noun phrase subject and a T bar. So the T bar is just an intermediate step that's going to allow us to bring tense in and then introduce the verb phrase. So it's just to keep our trees um, branching into only two children. That's the whole purpose of uh, the T bar here. And under T, because we're just going to work in English, the only two options we're going to have are going to be plus past and minus past. And again, that's because English is a um, past and non-past language. So plus past is the past and minus past would be the non-past. Now, if we wanna talk about future time, we might see that this is a bit of a problem, but you know, we'll, we'll leave that for now and we'll say, okay, let's just keep with the, with the syntaxy grammatical understanding of tense, and we'll see how far this takes us. So if we have a sentence, Mary lost a wallet, let's not worry about quantifier raising right now. We're just taking a look at the tree. Um, you know, if you imagine there's an S in there, it looks exactly the same, but now we want tense information. So the fact that lost is past tense, we want that information in the tree. So we've included plus past under that T note but everything else is still the same as what we've had before. Uh, and I also have written determiner as DET just out of habit there, but D and DET are the same thing. Okay, so um, some of you might have seen the TP written as sort of like a three branching node before, NPT and VP. Uh, so again, um, we're just expanding this with T barge so that way it's two children each rather than having that three branching case. Okay, but we're not really drawing uh, too many trees. I'm just gonna draw some trees in these slides to illustrate some concepts, but you don't really have to worry about them uh, at this point but just so you know what's happening. Okay, so we're not gonna see trees for a while, but just so you know where tense is located in our syntax. Okay, so tense logic. Now, uh, 
tense logic, we're not going to make too complicated. So what we're doing is we're introducing a system of logic that can deal with tense. So it can, well, specifically, it can deal with time. It's called tense logic, but really it's more about translating time. And it's an extension of propositional logic. So we could make it an extension of predicate logic, but we're going to keep it simple. So uh, we're not going to do things like uh, the past and then loves x, y. We're not going to do predicates or anything like that. Uh, we're just going to keep it quite straightforward and do things like uh, in the past loves or where, where L is like a sentence. So uh, we'll just use some basic propositional logic and attach some uh, temporal operators into it. So how we think about time in this tense logic is we think about it in, in, in really two different ways. So imagine we have a timeline. We have two operators that talk about specific points. Now, I shouldn't say specific points. I should say that talk about either points or periods. And we have two operators that talk about points. So there's one operator that says, okay, there was some point in the past. So we don't know where in the past it is. But if this is now, we have some operator that we'll call P. And this just says there's some point in the past where an event occurred. But we don't know where it occurred in the past. It's just at, at some time in the past. Uh, and there's another operator that says sometime in the future, something happened. So we use P and F for those. We have two operators that instead of looking at points, look at periods. And these are periods that start from now. So either from now, looking all the way back into the past. So you can say like, it has always been the case. So we can use an H and this one is a little bit ugly to write. So sometimes I might just make this a really bold H. So this would be, it has always been the case that, so from now, all the time before now, um, whatever proposition is in there has always been true. And then we can talk about from now forward in time. So from now until forever, it will always be true. So this would be a G and you can just do like a G with like a little line there. Make it look sort of like a heart. Uh, why it's G, I don't know. Maybe always has a silent, silent G in it. So how we can use these operators is sort of just like how we did our binding in predicate logic. So we would have some sort of predicate like loves x, y. That would be a well-formed formula. And then we would put like an existential or a universal in front of it. Well, we can do the same idea here. We can take some sort of proposition, whether it's simple or complex. And then we can just choose an operator and we can put it in front of it. And then it sort of, it sort of binds everything inside. I shouldn't say binds, I should say it should scope over everything. And then that would say like in the past, both of these events happened or in the future, both of these events happened or it will always be the case that both of these events happened. So, I have two example sentences down here. And we can see how we can deal with tense. So one sentence is I slept. So I slept is past tense. And when we think about time, and, and this might be where there's a little bit of like, is, is this logic really translating exactly what we want it to? Um, and these are questions we can think about because time isn't straightforward. I slept. We're talking about, in our translation, a point in time in the past where sleeping occurred. 
Now, for most of us, when we say I slept, we're thinking of like, okay, it's four to nine hour period where sleeping occurred. But in this logic, we're thinking of it as like an event. There was like an event of sleeping and that event happened at a point. So if we say that like S is I sleep, then what we're saying is in the past, there was a point where that sleeping happened. So I slept in the past, I slept. So we can take this proposition, I sleep, and then we put the in the past or there was, there was a time such that operator in front of it, which was the P, and the P for past. So in the past, I slept. And that would be a translation for I slept. Uh, in six, we have the sentence, I will never fail nor die. So usually it's good to translate the propositions first and then deal with time and tense afterwards. So uh, never, so like will and never, so I never fail nor die, so I don't fail nor die, so I don't fail, so I not fail, and I not die, I don't die. Shouldn't so, it be an or, because it's either or or neither nor? Uh, when you say I will never fail nor die, this implies that you won't do either of them. So this is why we use an and here. Um, and that's because, okay, sorry. Um, if we negate it outside the brackets, it would be like not F or D outside the brackets. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm using De Morgan's law to distribute the negation inside the brackets and then flipping the sign. So not F or D is the same thing as not F and not D. So oh, okay. these, these are both equivalent. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, not fail or die is the same thing as not fail and not die. Okay, so I've made this translation. So now I need to think about the, the time aspect to it. And when we say will, we're talking about the future. So then the question is, are we talking about a, an event point, like one specific point in the future, or are we talking about like at all points in the future? And the key word here then, so, so this is giving us future information, again, future time, and never is telling us that, oh, this isn't just at one point, this is at all points. Like, you're never going to do this. So we're going to say, okay, actually, from now on until the end of time, this event will not happen. So we can say, okay, this is talking about an interval. So we can use G. And we can put this in front. So both of these are fine translations. So can you, will... oh, sorry, can you pull out the negative in front of the G? Um, if you pull the negative in front of the G, you're going to get a slightly different interpretation that we'll talk about. I don't know off the top of my head what that's going to be right now. But basically, if you pull the negative, well, we'll think about this. If we pull the negative outside of the G, what we're saying is, it's not true that it will always be the case that, which means that there's going to be some point in the future where you fail or die. So this would mean not always in the future. Um, it's sort of like how when you have an, have an existential and then you put a negation in front of some, 
you get no. So some dog, and then you put a negation in front of it becomes no dog. Uh, these behave in a, in a similar way where whether you negate outside the brackets or inside the brackets, there, there are differences. And, and we'll see that when we come to paraphrases. Okay, are there any questions about sort of like the basic, basic concepts behind these translations and the system of tense logic? Okay, so let's take a look at the syntax then. And I'm, I'm putting the syntax slide in, the syntax of tense logic in, just to sort of be consistent with everything else, even though for the most part, it's uh, covered here. So the only thing new, like we've seen all this stuff before above, if alpha and beta are whiffs, then you can do all the operators we've seen before. And the only new stuff is whatever well-formed formula we have, so if we have something like P and not Q, we can put any of these new tense operators in front of them. So we could say, okay, this is now, um, it has always been in the past that P and not Q. So we could do that. But what this also means is that we can go further. Uh, we could put multiple of these in front of each other. Now, what this means and where these are applied, uh, we'll, we'll think about this in a couple of cases. For the most part, we don't do this too often, um, but there are some cases where we might need to do this. And uh, we'll see where this is used to think about aspect. So things like had given versus gave, we might need to, use a couple of these operators back to back. And uh, I think we probably, I don't think we'll get to that today, but on Tuesday, when we talk more generally about this stuff, uh, that's when we'll introduce sort of the, using two of these at the same time. So, I mean, if we wanted to think about the trees for these, just have some sort of visualization, um, nothing. Too exciting, same thing as you would do in, uh, what's it, uh, predicate logic. You just separate the temporal operator from the proposition, and then you break down the proposition after. So uh, the structure is very, very similar to predicate logic. And you can imagine that if you introduce predicate logic with the tense operators and everything, um, it would get a little bit more complicated, but it would just be like having sort of two systems of predicate logic in the, in the same system in terms of what it looks like. Okay, so let's try translating some sentences into tense logic. And I guess you can try to work on these at the same time as me. Um, in fact, let me, let me put some of the operators in the top left, top right corner so we remember them. So this is P is point in past uh, F is point in future uh, H is always has, and G is always will be. So just so we have that reminder, I think P and F are easy to remember, but H and G are usually the ones that can get mixed up in my head. So 7A, 
I will never beat this video game. Okay, so this is nice because we just sort of saw we'll never. So we think about the time. So first of all, well, let's actually just assign a proposition. So let's just say like, uh, beat this video game. I guess we'll call it like B or something. And we have to remember negation too. So this is never beat this video game. So we should probably do uh, not B. And now for our time, we should probably think about, you know, what this means. So will is the future. So it's one of our two futures, either F or G. And are we talking about a point in time or are we talking about like a whole interval from now on until forever? Well, this is will, will never. So this is talking about an interval from now until the end of time, presumably. So this should be a translation with G. So um, it is always going to be the case that I don't need this video game. So that's like another way to paraphrase the sentence. It will always be the case that I never beat this video game. I will never beat this game. Okay, B and C are interesting. I went to a party and drank versus I went to a party and then drank. Okay, so let's deal with B first, because B is going to be a little bit simpler. I went to a party and drank. So we have two propositions here. Uh, let's say that P is I went to a party, and D is I drank. And I'm going to space these out a little bit. In fact, both of these are going to be roughly the same. Let's give them the same amount of spacing uh, and then see how these differ from each other. Okay, so I went to a party and drank. Um, how are we going to deal with this? Uh, what time are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the past, right? So I went to a party and drank. But which, yeah, it's a point in the past. Are, are both of the points in the past or are just one of the points in the past? And are they the same points in the past or are they different points in the past? Like, how should we interpret this sentence? This is sort of like the, the main question. And there's only really so much we can do with a sentence like I went to a party and drank. We, we can't really like take the sentence and make unnecessary inferences about what happened. So the best we can really do is say, okay, I went to a party and drank is just some collection of events that happened in the past. So yeah, both of these events happened in the past. Okay, so it's just a point in the past where both of these happen. And we don't know a timeline of P and D. But what about something like I went to a party and then drank? So both of these happen in the past. Okay, so the beginning, I'll give you a little hint here. The beginning is quite similar. But how do we deal with this point where we say, and then we drank? So to draw a little timeline, we're now here. This is our point in the past. So how do we get this then drank involved? You use another quantifier? Yeah, we use an, another one of our temporal operators here. So basically, this is like our new now when we're inside P and D. So if we're saying, and then we drank, we can sort of talk about another point in the future from there where the drinking occurred. So we can actually use another operator here and say, well, in the future, so in the past, there was partying and drinking, but in that past reference point, 
after the partying, there was a future point where the drinking occurred. So a little bit more involved, but this lets us establish a little bit of a timeline. Because what we're saying is that both of these events occurred in the past. We're establishing that fact. P and D occurred in the past, but D occurred further in the future than P. So, and so this is kind of nice. Um, way earlier in the course, when we talked about propositional logic in the conjunction and we first introduced it, and I showed you that example, like Mindy got married and got pregnant and Mindy got pregnant and got married. I said that in semantics, we don't really have a way of dealing with time and the inference of time. It's like, well, uh, what I really went to say was, in our course with our simple systems, we don't have a way of dealing with it. But now, if we want to actually incorporate the implications there, the inferences, there's actually a way of doing it. So we can talk about which event happened first. So we're able to actually deal with these sequences of events. So a nice little contrast between I went to a party and drank and I went to a party and then drank. Uh, okay, this is a, this D is a stupid sentence, but it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, I defeated a pigeon, but in the future, the pigeon will defeat me. Okay, so uh, in B and C, the, the temporal operators are scoping across the entire proposition. In D, we're going to have to do something a little bit different. So I defeated a pigeon. So uh, let's say that's D. So I defeated a pigeon. So I defeated a pigeon is a point in the past. So in the past, I defeated a pigeon. But, okay, so this is an and. In the future, so at some point in the future, the pigeon will defeat me. So let's call this P. So you can say PD and FP, or in the past, I defeated the pigeon, but in the future, the pigeon will defeat me. So here we have, in terms of our timeline, what we think about now, we have one event that happened in the past where there's with the defeating, and we're talking about one event that happens in the future where we think that the pigeon is going to attack back. So two separate events that aren't really linked to each other other than like the, the now timeline. Okay, E is sort of gross. It is not the case that it has always been the case that translations are not fun. Now, nobody in English talks like this, but we'll translate it and then we'll think of a paraphrase. So we'll think of some way that a, a normal English speaker would actually say this sentence. So actually to do this, we're just gonna translate this piece by piece. So we're not gonna do anything fancy. Uh, it is not the case that, it's just gonna be not, it has always been the case that, so this will be H, uh, translations are not fun. Okay, so there's a not, and then we'll call this F for fun. So we'll just say this is, it is not the case that it has always been the case that translations are not fun. Okay. Um, can anyone think of a paraphrase of how this would be said if maybe you were like a normal English speaker? Um, and let me try to try to give you a hint here. You can use, okay. 
Can you say trans, uh, sometimes translations are fun? Uh, sometimes translations are fun. So we can use translations are fun, but we're either going to be talking about the future or the past. So should we be talking about the past or the future? At, at some time in the past or at some time in the future, translations are fun. So what this sentence is saying, and if we think about this on a timeline, we're saying it is not the case that it has always been the case that translations are not fun. So basically we're saying that that not F is not true at all points in the past. Okay, so, so this is wrong. So what this means, and unfortunately this is a little bit too big for me to fit. Okay, right there. So what this means is that actually you could think of it as there being like, say, some point. So some translations have been fun during that time period, yes. So what you're saying is that there was at least some point in the past where translations have been fun. There's, a, there's at least one point in the past where translations have been fun. So one alternative way of translating uh let me use a different color for this uh not not always has not f would be to say in the past at some point in the past translations were fun Would the translation of translations are not fun be translations conjunction not fun? Uh, so I don't think I'm understanding the parse, the question. Um, uh, like in, in predicate logic, in, in predicate logic, you'd be separating translations and fun into separate things but in in sorry in predicate logic we'd be trying we'd be separating them but in tense logic we're just starting with propositional logic we're just using like whole sentences so translations are fun would be like a sentence a proposition and then we just negate it to be not if yeah 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 if we did predicate logic with this we'd just be making it like very complicated and i think we'd be distracted from sort of the, the, the point of tense and time. So I, I don't want to distract from the point. That's why we're just going to use propositions. Okay. So, I mean, this, this, this point from E is really just a side point. We don't need it for our translations, but uh, I thought we'd just think about sort of like alternative ways of, of thinking or translating. So um, are there any questions about A through D and, and also including E for these translations? I'm just taking a look at the assignment translations right now to, to see if there's anything uh, on these questions that maybe we should talk about that I didn't talk about here, but from what I'm looking at, everything in these four translations, I think will cover that information. Um, oh, what I should specify too, and I think this is always worth mentioning, uh, we can still have sentences 
that don't use future and past temporal operators. So it is perfectly fine to have a sentence like, uh, you know, I eat food and to just translate that as like F. We can still have regular translations like that that don't deal with the past or the future. Uh, I know this is like a generic statement where I said this is something where it's like, a, it's a regular occurrence. Uh, but with the way that we have our translations using like at a point in the future or from now on until the future, um, we would just translate this as like a regular proposition F. So it's sort of one of the limitations of the system, right? Is how do we deal with these generic statements that are habits? Well, the tense logic, we still can't really do these generic statements that occur from like the beginning of our life to the end of our life. We just translate these as like F. So that should be enough for assignment six. Um, one more thing here. So for paraphrases, uh, we just did one with H and P. So what I wanna say is that when we paraphrase, uh, P and H are gonna be paraphrases of each other and F and G will be paraphrases of each other. And it's because when we think about the timeline, uh, both of P and H will be in the past and both F and G will be in the future. So we're talking about like all time versus a point in time. So not always in the future would mean that there's some point in the future where that thing doesn't happen. Uh, not always in the past where something happens mean there's some point in the past where it doesn't happen. So if we think about paraphrases like... Um, Okay, so it is not the case. Okay, so here's, here's a timeline. It is not the case that there was a time where I do not care. So we're saying that there was no point in the past where I do not care. Sorry, uh, you see for that. So basically we're saying on a timeline, if we take a look in the past, we can't find an individual point where there was no caring occurring. So what this means is that if we take a look at every time in the past, there was caring occurring. Because if we can't find a single point in the past where that person didn't care, then that clearly means that the person cared at every time in the past. So not P, not C, so no points in the past where not caring is the same thing as having always cared. Just fill those in. Uh, similarly, if we flip this to the future and say there's no point in the future, where I don't care. So there's not a specific point in the future where I don't care. That's like saying at all points in the future, I care. So not F, not C would be the same thing as saying it will always be the case that I care. And, and, and. So this is sort of my last point. Remember, we talked about in logic, in predicate logic, I said something like, if we did not all, not P, we could do like this weird minus plus system, and then we could do these conversions and flip the operators and get an equivalent translation that was like exists in XPX. So we could do something like this and get an equivalent translation. Turns out you can do the same thing in this system. So not P, not C. Well, we could do minus and pluses for these. We just flip, we just flip the operators, P's to H's and F's to G's. And uh, we get a pretty similar 
outcome. That works the same as we did in predicate logic with our shortcuts. So I don't know if you remember that or if that's still in well, if it's still in your memory, but uh, the equivalencies, the little trick there still holds for this system, which is pretty neat. So either you can sort of reason it out and think about timelines, or you can just sort of resort to the little trick. Um, but anyway, that's sort of the, the, the technical side of tense and time that we covered today. And uh, next time we'll talk more generally about some issues with tense and time and some extensions of the system with tense and time and just talk about some terms that I thought were important for linguistics that aren't really covered in other courses that we'll talk about here. So if you have any questions, you can stick around. But other than that, um, thanks for coming out and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Trevor. Oh yeah, enjoy your weekend, it's Friday. And it's gonna be nice out, so enjoy it. Are these uploaded right after the lectures? Um, it is uploaded as soon as the Zoom, oh. I do have to leave for a bit after this, so it will probably be uploaded sometime around at least by 3 to 4 p.m. today. I would do it immediately right now, but um, Zoom has to like save it, which takes about 45 minutes. <laughs>